Amazing love that welcomes me. The kindness of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving. So good, God, you're so good, God, you're so good, you're so good to No 
Just lift that up.
first loved us. Amen. Offer up a praise to him. Come on, church. Put your hands together. Lift up a praise to him. This should be a byproduct of our faith. Amen. Lifting up praise to him. I hope you don't feel uncomfortable with that. But if you do, get comfortable. We should give him praise always. Always. The Bible tells us that. And we should live that life of praise and worship to him. Thank the worship team this morning for getting us going. But we should come in here ready to go. Amen. That's a lifestyle. Worship and praise unto him that we can live that joyous life in Christ, peace and joy. It's so good to gather with you today. We're glad to see you. If you're a guest, we welcome you. I think we have some here that may be the first time. We're glad you're with us. We come to worship the Lord and give Him thanks. Amen? Because God is good, and there's no better place to be this morning than right here with you. We're going to receive our tithes this morning and our offerings uh, today's offerings will be for missions, for Peru missions, Columbia missions, local missions, and everything in between. Uh, thank you, church, for giving. Uh, even in our, our food pantry box that runs over. Hallelujah. It's good. It's good to, to clean that out. So God bless you for your giving. I know that he will. And in turn, it will help someone else. Uh, it'll, it'll bless someone else. And we're so thankful to be just that small part uh, that we can do that. But in our missions, in our giving, it goes to help other people. It helps change lives. It equips believers in other, par other areas, other areas of the world, and even in our local places. It equips believers. It helps get things there, teachings, uh, many different things. So... We bless you and praise you for that. Father, we lift you up this morning, giving you praise, God, for who you are. Thank you for loving me and loving us, God. Thank you for your son, Jesus, that we are here to celebrate and give praise and honor to today. God, we know it's an exciting day that you have much for us, that you will bring the word to us to feed us while we're here. You will feed us, God, from your word, and that our spirits may grow strong, our faith can grow strong. And God, we, we obediently bring in the tithe and the alms and, and our offerings for, the, for Peru and uh, the other missions, God, but we ask your blessings upon that, not up only on that offering, but upon those pastors and teachers in those other areas, God, that they may be blessed and feed their congregations. In Jesus' name, amen. Worthy be praised. That's why we're here today to celebrate God together. All week long, we should be celebrating the Lord. All week long, we should be celebrating and praising the Lord. We do that as individuals as we walk out our Christianity. Worship is not an event. Serving God is not an event. Serving God, worship is a lifestyle. That's what, that's what we do. The only difference in what we do all week and now is now we come together corporately to do it. So there's synchronism there. So we, we come together to walk this out in spirit and in truth with each other 
and we let the devil know that there's more than just one of us. Somebody ought to shout, man. Praise the Lord. God is good all the time. <clears throat> all the time. And so as we move forward here, we want you to know that starting next Sunday evening is our adventure camp. I don't know, it might be a rough one today. It's, you guys are really slow. I, I felt for the worship team this morning, it was like they were pulling us. How many of you know the enemy doesn't want us to have any kind of liberty, huh? Yeah. But whom the sun sets free is free indeed, amen? And so we just bind the enemy this morning and tell him right now he doesn't have no place. Adventure camp next Sunday. That's what I was on, I believe, wasn't I, Rachel? Adventure camp next Sunday. All Woo! Man, they're gearing up. They're working hard. They got a meeting today. They got uh, decorations starting and, and putting up. And so I want to encourage you. Tell your neighbors. Tell your friends. Tell anybody you see. Put it on Facebook yourself. Do whatever you got to do to let everybody know out here that we've got something going on. And it's going to be wonderful. Get them registered. Get them signed up. Get them ready. And then I know this. When you do that, we're going to see them come in. And I tell you right now, when they get here, they will be blessed. They will get ministered to. They will experience something with the Lord. Amen. So do that. Get busy. Like. We shouldn't have to still be saying this, but. All you Facebook people that have an account, anytime you see anything from Bethesda, what are you supposed to do? Like and share. Like and share. Why? Because that not only goes out to Bethesda people, it goes out to all those around us that are friends and family and public. All right? So do that. Okay, praise the Lord. Let's all stand this morning. It's time for meet and greet. So go around, high five, fist bump, welcome somebody.
You're the God of covenant, of faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak. Cause great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting same, I will praise your name. Your faithfulness to me. Seasons change, you remain the same. Thank you, Lord. God, from age to age, and though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same, yeah. Your history can prove there's nothing you can't do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak. A word it will come to pass Cause great is your faithfulness to me Great is your faithfulness to me From the rising sun to the setting same I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. Oh, your faithfulness never runs out. Never. From 
from the rising sun to the setting, same I will praise your name. And from the rising sun to the setting, same I will praise your name. And from the rising sun to the setting, same I will praise your your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting sun, I will praise your name. Because great is your faithfulness to me. Yeah. Come on, let's give the Lord a praise. Bless your name, God. Bless your name. Bless your name, Lord. Bless your name, Lord. Bless your name. We give you the glory, we give you the honor, we give you the praise. You are worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy, Lord. We want to bless your name. Thank you, Lord. God is good. We are blessed. How many of you feel like you're blessed? How many of you are fighting the fight of faith? Trying to lay hold of eternal life. Not wavering to the right or the left, but trying to keep your focus on the rightness of God. I want to walk in the rightness of God, don't you? want to live it. We've been talking about the kingdom of God, and I've been speaking for a while on kingdom of God versus Christianity, because whether we want to admit it or not, in the hour and day that we live in, Christianity in a lot of ways is opposed to the kingdom of God. It's an opposition in how it operates and functions. When we came into the kingdom of God, or came to the kingdom of God, Jesus told Nicodemus, if you're going to enter into the kingdom of God, you must be born again. Of course, Nicodemus didn't understand that he couldn't separate then the, the natural from the spiritual. And, and so Nicodemus' natural question was, well, wait a minute, how can somebody who's old like myself enter in a second time into his mother's womb? And Jesus said, wait a minute, you're mixing up the natural and the spiritual. He said, but what I'm talking about is, I'm talking about a natural birth of water, and I'm talking about a spiritual birth by the Spirit of God. So, so what Jesus was saying was, if somebody's going to enter into the kingdom of heaven, if somebody's going to enter into the kingdom of God, they first and foremost must be born again in order to do that. And so a person needs to be able to point to two births. Right? Doesn't that make sense? I can point to two births. I can point to in June, on June 9th, 1978, at Norton Hospital in Louisville, Kentucky, my parents, my mother, my parents gave birth to me. The the most handsome one, the most talented one, gifted one in our whole family. In 1960, that happened. I have a brother seven years older than I am, and I have a sister sitting there 
that's five years older than I am, and I have two, uh, a brother younger and a brother si- a sister younger, and of course, they, you know how it is, the middle one is always the most gifted and most talented, and so it's just the way it is, whether they like it or not. I mean, when you look at me, you then can say yes and amen to that when you look at the rest of them. You front row people better be speaking up. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. But I can point to that natural birth, but I also then come along, and I I didn't realize all of this. I'm speaking it now, but I didn't realize this when it was taking place. There was a second birth that took place with me in 1978 in Louisville, Kentucky at 2265 Crumbs Lane in a place called Larkwood Church got a prophecy that as a revival meeting was going on, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit quickened me and regenerated me and extended to me the gift of faith and the gift of repentance, and I was born again. What what also though happened there? What 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 do we need to realize? Something else happened. You see, up until 1978, from 1960 all the way up to 1978, I was operating in a different way than I operated after 1978. From 1960 to 1978, I was under another form of government, and that form of government was called self. I did what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it and how I wanted to do it. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Unless you were in church all your life and you still had issues until you were born again, you know what I mean. I didn't care. It didn't matter to me. I was out to seek my own pleasure, my own self. I was being self-governed. I had self-determination that I was going to do what I wanted to do. I didn't really care about how many people thought about it or what they thought about it. I was out to please myself. I was governed by self. Other words, I was, in, I was being governed by the unholy trinity, me, myself, and I. That's an unholy mixture right there if you don't already know it. There's no place for me and I. There's no place for me in this. Because when I came to the kingdom of God, I subjected myself Began, I began, and I say began because anybody arrived yet? Anybody feel like, oh man, I got it all together? I, I'm just asking. So I began a journey of leaving self-government to going underneath and walking in his government. Kingdom rule, kingdom authority kingdom power, doing what Jesus wanted me to do. Not my will, but your will be done. If if that's not what you're doing, if that's not what you're after, then you need to check yourself to find out, am I really born again? Hello? You know, a lot of people say they're Christians, but Jesus said, a lot of you praise me with your lips, but your heart's far from me. How many of you know being born again is a heart thing? Something's had to take place within me, inside of me, that began to work on me. There was a seed planted in me. The Bible says it's the DNA of God. The seed of God was planted in me by the Holy Spirit that now that inner man is being renewed Day by day and moving and growing, not that he is not, not that he's not in control, but he gets more and more in control as I die to self. We know that self is still trying to rule. Self wants to do what it wants to do. So what do I have to look at? The first thing I have to look at is I have to look at, God, what is your will and your plan? I said last week that we spend a lot of time going around going, oh, I just don't know what God's will is. I'm praying for God's will. Oh, God, do this. Oh, God, do that. Oh, God, show me this. And you know what I believe God is doing? God is saying, I already showed you. 
If you're quiet, I'm going to preach for two and a half hours. <laughs> Dale, you need to sit closer to the front, brother. God God's says, I have already given you my will. All you have to do is look. He has given us from Genesis to Revelation, which is a revealing of the will and the plan and the purpose of God. We don't have to ask God, what is your will? What we should be praying for and what we should be after, which I believe takes then the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your life. What we should be after is, God, give me a revelation of your will when I don't know. But Jesus said the majority of the time, everything that you're reading, everything you're looking at, it's so simple that even a little child can understand it. You know why, we, you know why it gets complicated on us? You know how we're walking around, bobbing and weaving to the right and left, not knowing what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. And, and oh my goodness, I just don't know. Do you know every day of my I don't have to pray. I don't have to pray. God, help me to speak to somebody today about your love. I... I I already know he already said go and do it. Didn't he? It's kind of like it's kind of like what we say around here. You don't pray about praying. You you don't pray about fasting. Oh God, should I fast or should I not fast? No, the word of God says fast. But I might have to pray and say God, what kind of a fast would you like for me to do? God, how long of a fast would you like for me to do? But I don't have to pray about fasting. That should be a part of my life. I don't have to pray about telling somebody about Jesus. That should be a part of my life. God has called us to sow and water. He said in Matthew 28, he said, go. Matthew 28, uh, 18 through 20 and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And, and what does he say about that authority? That authority that's been given to me, I also what? Give to you. And so he says, Go, therefore. Now, Pastor Jerry, you know what? I know you said this, but should I be meeting with people, making disciples? I, 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 I don't even know how to answer that. I mean, it's obvious, right? Is there a question in there somewhere? Why, why, why am I doing it? Should I do it? No, it's go, therefore. Is this just for a certain amount of people? Certain groups, certain titles, certain individuals? No, he says, go, therefore, and make disciples of who? All the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, name of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, which is what? Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. I'll tell you what, go. I'll tell you what, you're not going by yourself. Man, isn't that awesome? Every moment of every day, I have the power of God working in me. Jesus is with me. How's he with me? Because, you know, the Bible says Jesus went to be with the Father. He that ascended, also, he that descended also ascended, right? And the Bible says now he sits. How many of you know Jesus has a physical body now? Huh? Jesus has a physical body. And so it says he sits. In other words, it's talking about his seat of authority, a seat of power. He sits at the right hand of the Father. And what's he doing? He's making intercession for us. He's interceding for us. When the accuser of the brethren, how many of you know the accuser of the brethren still comes up to the throne and starts talking about you? He's not, he's not, he's not been totally cast out of there yet. There's coming a day when he's going to be cast down. He'll no longer have access to go make accusations against us. But it's not yet. He's still going up there and he's saying, you know, Jesus... You know Doug Gibson down there. Man, he's blah, 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 and he starts vomiting. And you know what Jesus does? Jesus says, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. I've washed him in my blood. His sins are forgiven past, present, 
and future. And then Jesus, he prays for us. He intercedes for us. He says, Father, remember them. God, you gave them to me, and I ask you, Lord, I ask you, Father, while I was on the earth, you keep them, you hold on to them, you protect them, you watch out for them, and God, let's go help them. And how does he go and help us? He goes and helps us through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Father and the Son are not here on the earth except by one way, and that is through and by the governor, the Holy Spirit. Woo! That ought to give you chill bumps. The governor, the Holy Spirit, is in here. He's everywhere. He can be in here, I should say. He might not be in there for you. Well, Pastor, I gave my heart to Jesus. I know, but that's not, that doesn't, that's not when it says he comes and takes up residence. Jesus said, hey, you guys, guess what? I'm getting ready to leave here. Can you imagine those guys? Man, they were with Jesus. They had had a revelation of who Jesus was by then. Did you know that? We, we put it off until after Jesus leaves, but I want you to know they knew who Jesus was while he was still on this earth. Hey, guys, who do people say I am? Well, some say you're Elias, some say you're Jeremiah, some say you're one of the prophets. Okay, but you've been with me. Who do you, Peter, say that I am? Thou art the Christ. Other words, you are the Son of God. You're God in the flesh. And Jesus said, Peter, flesh and blood could not have revealed that to you. But my Father in heaven had to show you that. How did he show Peter that? Jesus had breathed on them a deposit of the Holy Spirit. And they were receiving this revelation. Even though Jesus hadn't left you. But Jesus said to them, I want you not to be fearing. I don't want you to be afraid. I'm leaving here, but don't get concerned about it because I want you to know something. It's necessary. How many of you are glad, how many of you are glad Jesus said it was necessary? It's necessary. It's necessary. It's necessary. It's necessary. Why? Because right now, Holy Spirit's with you. Right now, he can, He's on you. He sometimes works through you. But I'm going to tell you what, there's coming a better day. Huh? He wasn't talking about no Pentecostal foolishness. He wasn't talking about no charismatic mumbo jumbo. He was talking about a better day that was coming when the Holy Spirit wouldn't just be with you. He wouldn't just be on you. He said there's coming a day. There's going to be a change under the new covenant. He's not going to be just with you. He's going to be in you. And when he is in you, what does he say? He will, he, will, he will carry you. He will bring you. He will show you all truth. Other words, the revelator, the one that gives revelation, will show you all things you need to know. So I don't need to be concerned about the will of God. I have. The will of God right in front of me. We don't know the will of God because we don't know the book. We, are ra we have raised up one gigantic, ignorant church. Hello? That's why churches, the church can't discern false teachers. That's why the church can't discern false apostles and false prophets. That's why the church can't discern between good and evil. You know, what I'm, you know I'm telling you the truth. You say, what are you doing bashing the church? I'm talking about all of us. We have been asleep. Jesus said, oh, you look good, sound good, do things that are good. But I've got something against you. What is it, Jesus? You left your first love. And because you left your first love, you're lukewarm or asleep, right? 
And when you're, but he said, wait a minute, when you take the word of God, Hebrews 5, j- chapter tw- verse 12 says, when, when you ought to be teachers, you have need again somebody to teach you the very elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ. Why? Because by reason of use, by your experience, by taking what you've been giving and using and putting into practice in your own life, you handled the word of God like you should. He said, by that, Strong meat belongs to those who are mature, who by reason of use can discern both good and evil. How many people in here know, and you've known it since you were little, because your parents probably took a switch to you, it's wrong to lie. Did anybody in here ever lie to your mom and dad? <laughs> Holy smoke, man, I tell you what, I was a perpetual liar. Almost everything that came out of my mouth as a teenager was a lie. Because I knew if I told the truth, I was going to get a worse beating. So I lied. How many, how many of you knew when you were young, when you lied, you knew it was wrong? Right? You were taught it. Right? How many of you knew when you were young, when you took that piece of gum... You know, it used to be a penny. What's a penny? Now you can give that out, and you can't even get a piece of gum. But back when you were little, you, you, how many of you ever stole anything? I know some of you probably never did, but you stole something. You took something that wasn't yours. Now all you church people that's been raised in church, I know you did it. I know you did it, Natalie. But most of us know we've... We've taken something, borrowed something, never returned it, right? How many of you know we don't need discernment about whether we should lie? We really don't need discernment about whether we should steal. We don't need discernment whether we should murder. We don't need discernment whether we should commit adultery or fornication. We don't need, a, we don't need discernment to know that we shouldn't hate somebody. Come on. Right? But we need discernment to know what it is that we ought to be doing and how we ought to be walking. We need discernment between those things. How many of you know we don't need discernment to know whether it's right or wrong for a man to marry a man or a woman to marry a woman? Do we need discernment for that? Do we got to go, oh God, Holy Spirit, come on, is that right? No, you know why it's not right? I'll tell you one of the reasons why it's not right. God said it's not right. But the second reason is, is because all it can produce is death. You can't produce life. A man and a man can't produce life. I don't care what they try to tell you science has discovered. A man, a man cannot have a baby. If a man is walking around, somebody named Bob is walking around. I know you think when you see this, I'm just, this isn't me. Real, I'm punching this out. Really, this is flat, six-pack ass. I'm, I'm pooching this out. If a man is walking around and, they're go, and you go to them and say, hey, how, how are you doing? Oh, it's rough. I'm, I'm in my seventh month. Whew. I just can't wait to get rid of this. I'm going to tell you what they were born they were born a man, and, or they were born a woman, and now they identify as a man. But I'm going to tell you what, their DNA, their DNA, and unless they've had a surgery done by some, some surgeon, their, their, their other parts are man or woman, no matter what their ID is. Do you need discernment to know that? Do we need discernment to know what the scripture says concerning birth, babies? No, God makes it perfectly clear. I knew you while you were in your mother's womb. And we say, okay, well, that could be like at eight weeks, 12 weeks. You know, that, I mean, in the, in the time of viability. God said he knew them. Okay, well, that's not good enough for you. He also says, while you were in your father's loins. Well, that kind of kills it, don't it? That right there kills it. While you were in your father's loins. I could go a little further with that, but I'm not going to. But hey, listen, when you, knew, when you were in your father's loins, I knew you. He even told 
some of uh, Jacob's sons, that they paid tithe while they were in their father's loins. And what he did accounted to them as righteousness because of what their father did. I'm going to tell you what, that's, you think about it, let your, let your small little mind think about all that. That's pretty big stuff. But we don't need discernment for all that. We know, don't we? We know that when that, when that seed of the man and the woman come together and it, it, it collides and there is a pregnancy, man, that's a baby. Even the world knows it because when a woman gets killed in a car crash and she's pregnant, they get it for a double homicide. That's how ignorant people are to even argue. But we don't have to have discernment to know that. There are just some things, man, you don't have to discern. But apparently the church needs to have discernment on spiritual matters. How we walk things out, how we live. What's faithfulness, what's commitment, what's covenant. How should I be discipled? What should you be pouring into me? Or what do I need to know? We need to some discernment there. But I want you to know this, that God established spiritual authority. He established headship. He established a flow of authority before you and I were ever thought about. From the very foundation of the world and before that. Because you know the kingdom of God was prior to anything created. How many of you know God always was? Always is, always will be. And before there was earth, he created, he created the angels and the seraphim and the cherubim. And they would worship him around his throne day and night. In other words, it was constant. It's not necessarily that it was never nighttime there. It was constant. They were constantly. So that we can understand it both day and night. It's constant. All the time they're worshiping God. Crying, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Who was and is and is to come. There were sons of God that were created. Did you know that? They weren't angels. They were sons of God. Out of those sons of God, there was a morning star that was created. His name is Jesus. He is above all else. Greater than anything there, anything here, or anything below the earth. How many of you know there's three realms? Heaven, which you and I know very little about. Earth which we still don't know a whole lot about, and below the earth, where there is a power and principalities that operate, that one day will be revealed, and one day will live for eternity in complete, utter torment and rejection of God. But before, before all those things, or before all what we see, there was the kingdom of God. In that kingdom of God, there was order. And when the order was disrupted, God dealt with it, did he not? But I want us to know that that, that same order, God has extended to this earth. Do you know that the kingdom of God is to come here like it is there right now? Jesus, teach us to pray. Okay, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven... Hallowed be thy name. How many of you live your life worshiping the Jesus, Jesus, worshiping the King of kings, loving on the Father, going into his presence, entertaining him, beholding his beauty, inquiring in his temple? Now, we give him glory. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth. As it is, you're, you're getting there, in heaven. We want God, oh, Jesus said, pray this, that the same thing there would transpire here. 
And we know that Adam lost that. Adam gave that away. Adam gave his power and his authority away. But the Bible says what the first Adam failed to do, what he gave away, the second Adam came and he brought back to us or restored to us the kingdom of our God. So that now you and I, through the power of the Holy Spirit, can even walk in this life like Adam and Eve walked in the original expression of God's kingdom on this earth. Man, I, I wish I could just take time and go through a lot more of that, but this is just kind of a snapshot. But do you see what I'm talking about? We're living way below our privileges. We're living way below what we can live, how we can live. Because we walk in our own ways and our own mindset and we're governed by our own selves. We don't want to give way to what God says. We give way to what we say. Even people who call themselves Christians. You know, God has an order of authority and he's not going to step out of that authority. But you know what God says about himself? God says he's sovereign. How many of you know God is sovereign? Hey, God, I really don't like how you're doing this, and I think you need to change it up. How many of you know God says, um, well, I guess you have a right to ask a question about that, but I do what I want to? Huh? Do you, do you think, for a minute, just, just try to think with me. Try to get outside your theological barriers for a minute and get outside your, your barriers of God being fair and what God thinks is right, what God thinks is love, what God thinks is just. Get outside that for a minute and put yourself for a second into the shoes of the Israelites. When people, leadership, led them astray and they started worshiping golden calves. And God is angry, sends Moses. As a matter of fact, God's angry. He says, I'll just destroy them. Moses goes, hold on a minute, God, wait a minute. Moses, being a type of Christ, makes intercession. Do you see that? For God's people. Hold on a minute, God. You, you promised. He didn't question God. God, you know what? You don't have the right to do that. He said, God, now, hold on. You promised. All right, Moses, okay. I'm not going to do it, but get down there. Moses goes down there. And, and this is what Moses does. Moses says to the priest, get you, get you some of those real sharp blades. Put them on your shoulders like this. And then I want you priests to run through that part of the congregation. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And they ran through that part of the congregation, and guess what? Somewhere in the vicinity, 24,000 people got cut asunder. Man, woman, boy, and girl. How, how, many of you, how many of you think maybe there might have been in that number some that were, they maybe were, they weren't a part of what was going on over here. They just happened to be standing there. Maybe, maybe there was a son or a daughter standing there. Maybe it was their dumb dad or their dumb mom that did it. Yes, teenagers, I want you to know, us adults confess sometimes parents are dumb. Sometimes we say and do stupid stuff. But you're still required to honor us and love us and be obedient. But yet we admit to you that we're oftentimes wrong. Well, I can see them. I can see somebody on the other side that didn't get cut asunder. Oh. Oh. You, you see, it took Caden's head right off. Caden was over here with me talking about how he thought this was horrible for this to be going on. But he's gone. How many of you know we don't have a right to say, hey, God, what are you doing? You blew it. You messed up. Why is that? Why do we not have a right to question God? We can ask God a question, but why do we not have a right to question God? Well, Paul tells, the, uh, tells us in Romans, he said, you don't have a right to question God because how can the clay say to the potter, why? 
Have you ever created anybody? Have you ever made anybody? Have you ever done anything? No, the potter does it. The potter molds and shapes. The potter raises up whom he will. The potter puts down whom he will. The potter calls and the potter chooses. I'm going to tell you what the potter also does. He raises up vessels of honor. And he also raises up vessels of dishonor. Now, I'm going to tell you what, in my little peon brain, that don't sound fair. But what are we talking about here? We're talking about God's sovereignty. God is sovereign. All authority resides in God. He is the only true potentate. Everything else evolves from God. Do you know God decides and has set the line in your life how long you're going to live and when you're going to die? That's why church people shouldn't say stupid things like, oh my goodness, they, they died way before their time. Really? God was up there going, oh, oh, did you guys know that they were going to die? Huh? Do you see, I'm, I'm, I'm really dramatizing that, but do you see what I'm saying? God sets those things in order, not us. He's the only true potentate. Everything else that flows from him, it doesn't make any difference who it is. Even the devil is delegated authority from God. He is the only potentate. All authorities are delegated. Authorities that seem evil are evil. They exist because God allows them to exist. They have seasons, though, and they have boundaries. Do you hear me? Do you understand all that? I don't. I, I believe it, though. You know why I believe it? Because I believe God's all truth. Do, have I ever said, God, why... Why did you create Lucifer? How many of you know when God created Lucifer, he made him, he made him the splendor of heaven? Instruments, and he was in charge of worship. He, he oversaw that, and, and he, had, he had all these instruments. He was, he was a glorious cherubim. A glorious archangel. All kinds of authority and all kinds of power. How many of you know when God created him, God already knew what he was going to do? Huh? Do you really believe anything at all whatsoever takes God by surprise? He knew it. So have you ever just asked God, God, you know, why would you have created him if you knew what he was going to do? Because what, see, what we don't see is that God has a plan. And everything that's created, everything that's done, is done according to God's plan. To bring out the ultimate end, which you and I can't see, and we don't comprehend, and we don't understand. It brings out to the end. What is that? God's glory. You see, when God raises up a vessel of dishonor over here, and he doesn't call them with the effectual call, and he doesn't choose them. Yes, it's a horrible thing, and it's sad to us to see somebody perish without God. Anybody ever had somebody you knew perish without the Lord? I mean, you know, unless something happened at the last second before they do their last breath, their life did not project, did not portray any fruit of repentance. It's not wrong for us. It's not wrong for us to say, man, I know that God holds eternity in his hands, but that didn't look good. But how many of you know that if God raised that person up to be a vessel of dishonor, that God had a reason and a purpose for doing that, and it probably was for some others around them, that he used them, even in their dishonor, to bring glory to his plan. Now, that's hard for us to get a hold of. 
because we try to bring, instead of us going to God, we try to bring God to us. We try to think, bring God down to our understanding and our thinking. How many of you know our understanding of love is warped? Our understanding of judgment is warped. Our understanding of justice is warped. But God's understanding is perfect. And when I can't understand something, I don't have a right to go and challenge God or to try to make something up as far as how that can't be right. I am to take the word of God and what God says and believe it no matter what. Even when it goes contrary to my way of thinking. I can say to you easy, that doesn't make sense to me. I mean, to me, that doesn't seem fair, but then God didn't come and ask me. I don't know why God chose me and maybe not somebody else. I ran with a lot of guys when I was a teenager. We were ruffians, heathens, hellions, and we were a bad bunch of people. I, 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 I just don't understand why God reached into that group and pulled me out and chose me but not them because as of right now I don't know if he's chosen or not that's the thing about it a lot of times we want to get into stuff like you know we want to get into stuff like predestination we want to get into stuff like election we want to get into stuff that's really meat and we don't even have a good foundation in the milk that's why we get messed up we get enough knowledge about us that we're just messing up. That's all there is to it. And we, and we start looking at all that, and we try to figure that all out, and we try to understand it all. But the whole simple fact of the matter is, is that God's already figured it all out. God already understands it all. And for some reason, he, he reached down and pulled me out. Now, I still pray for them. I still cry out to God for them. I still fast for them. I still believe for them. Because guess what? God knows whether they're going to make it in or not. How many of you know God knows every single person that's going to be in heaven right now or before there ever was on earth? He already knew. But guess what? We don't. We don't know. We don't know. And what the devil will try to do to you is he'll try to get you to get walk in this the, theology of fatalism that says, well, if God knows, then there's no reason for me to do anything. Because what will be, will be. But how do you know that's not God's plan? God called me to pray. God called me to go after everybody. God called me to look at the scripture and say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For what reason? To win people. To bring people to the kingdom. I don't know who's going to be there and who's not. So my role is to go after everybody. God's all-powerful, even evil exists because God allows them to. Jesus has all authority in heaven, earth, and under the earth. Jesus is the king of kings. He has a kingdom, and he is the king of that kingdom. The church is what makes the kingdom of God visible as Jesus as king. How do I know if I am walking in the kingdom, because if I'm walking in the kingdom, I'm not the king. You're not the king. Jesus is the king. Under him were kings and priests, but Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. We're kings and lords in his kingdom, serving under the king of kings. So everything that flows on this earth, it has been, de been delegated authority by God to operate and, fu and function. First thing I want us to just take a quick look at is the natural authority. Do you know there's a natural authority that God has placed into, on this earth? It says God ordained it. All authority is ordained by God, correct? Even evil, governments. Kingdoms, presidents, vice presidents, 
senators, congressmen, governors, mayors, city councils, all that stuff is ordained by God. You say, oh, I can't believe that. I can't believe how wicked they are. God didn't ordain that. Yeah, he did. He did. He ordained it for his purpose and his plan. I don't, again, I don't understand it, but what does he say for me to do? Does he say for me to go fight them all the time? No, he says for me to pray for them. Now, I need to stand against what's vile and evil and wicked. I need to stand against that, but I need to pray, God, go after them. Holy Spirit, touch them, save them, bring them to understanding of your ways. He says, pray for them. But he set all that in order. Do you know God even set an order for us in the home? Now, we don't like it a lot of times, but we know it's the truth. He gave an order for us in the home that we would walk out his way, not our own. Correct? He says, he says in the home, back a slide, I think. Yeah. He says in 1 Corinthians 11.3, I should have, 1 Corinthians 11.3, so go back one more, sorry. He says, but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. And so what does he do? He ordains an authority in the natural realm that the home should be operated under, so that it can function properly. When it does not operate this way, there's chaos. First and foremost, now, now, now we understand as we go here, there's, there's not always, how many of you know there's hardly ever just an innocent party? Huh? Hardly ever an innocent party. Come on. I used to say this. My, my, my sister here, I hope she, she'll rebuke me later, but... She, she was married to uh, uh, her first husband. She was married to. He was raised Catholic. We weren't raised anything. And I gave my heart to the Lord. And then, of course, what, what would I want to do? I love God and I want to love my neighbor, my near ones. And so I'm going after her and speaking also to my other siblings. And so she goes to a revival meeting where, close to where she lived in St. Henry, Ohio, gives her heart to Jesus. Gives her heart to Jesus. And he, now they didn't, go to, they didn't go to Mass. They didn't practice Catholicism. They didn't do anything, correct? But man, when she gave her heart to Jesus, it was like all hell broke loose. He went crazy. And man, he, he refused. He told her she couldn't do it. She wasn't going. She wasn't going to do it. I went down, tried to talk to him. And, you know, and blah, 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 which did absolutely no good. He just went off his rocker. Well, what he did was he, 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 they divorced. He did all kinds of crazy things, but he divorced. And I used to say this to everybody. Man, I tell you what, if there was anybody innocent, it was my sister. But she'll tell you, and I can tell you, she wasn't innocent either. It takes two. But when we don't honor the head, then we mess up. And so we have Christ, and then the head of the man, the head of the husband is Christ. What is the husband's role, men? What is your role? You're there to protect your family. You're there to watch out for them. You want the best for them, even at your demise. Come on. It's not about what you want. It's about what he wants. And then what can I do because I love him? God, what can I do to serve my spouse, Sarita? Hello. To protect her, to watch out for her, to care for her. Listen, I want you to know something. I'm 63 years old. 
I know I don't look, I look 20 years younger than that. I don't know why you laughed louder than everybody on the front row. But I'm, I'm, I'm 63 years old. I want to tell you something. If Sri and I are out, and we're going through the mall, or we're doing something, and some man comes up to do her harm, he may kill me, but I'm going to tell you right now, he's going to know that there's been a holy ambush take place. Huh? You say, well, you know, Pastor Jerry, really, you, you, you should just leave what everybody's doing go and just start praying in tongues. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to pray in tongues, all right. I'm going to pray in tongues as my right hand lands across his chops. Amen. Huh? I, I'm, I mean, I'm telling you, listen, you, 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 you can talk about me like a dog. You members can go out here and you can run me down. You can say you don't agree with me. You can talk about me. You can say all can manner of, of whatever you want to against me. But I'm going to tell you something. You talk about my wife. You come against her. And you and I have a big problem. Because I'm there to protect her. That doesn't mean I think she's perfect. We can talk it out. We can settle it. We can get it all right. She'll humble herself, I know. She's a lot more humble than I am. She will, she will confess. But, but my role, my role, my role is to protect her at all costs. Somebody comes to break into my house to do damage and harm. I have a tactical shotgun. Behind my closed door, if he comes in at night, the first thing he's going to hear is, <laughs> if he doesn't run for his life, I'm going to shoot him. Now, you, may, you as members of the church, maybe you don't like that. Maybe that offends you. But I'm sorry, God's called me to protect my family. The Bible says if a man won't protect his family, if he won't provide for them, he's worse than an infidel. Some of you men, because our society is demasculating us, some of you men, because of our society is trying to turn every one of us into sissies, you won't rise up and do what you're supposed to. But I'm telling you, for me and my house, I will shoot you. If you mess with my family. I'm not going to ask any questions. You say, Pastor Jerry, won't you try... To get them saved first. No, that might give them just enough time to really hurt somebody. They better have taken care of all that before they came in. Huh? Sorry. No, I'm not. Protect my family. Then you know what it says? I'm to lead my family. I'm to be the example of what? Humility. I'm to be the example of love. I'm to be the example of righteousness. I'm to be the example of what a praying man is to be like. I am to be an example in here. Don't go back there and sit in the back during praise and worship while you're sitting there and here you are. Oh Lord, you're so wonderful. And if you feel funny as a man because you're lifting up your hands to worship God and tears may run down your face, then you don't know what a real man is. Somebody needs to slap out that macho spirit that you have. So I'm going to tell you what our kids need to see more than anything. Oh, we'll show them all kinds. Of, we'll show them our athleticism. We'll show them our toughness. We'll show them all that kind of stuff. But oh man, I can't. I just feel funny about raising up my hands. Be a man. Lead your family. Let your kids see. Let your wife see the fact that you're willing to lay yourself down on the floor beside your bed and cry out for them. Let your family hear you praying in tongues over your family, building yourself up in the most holy faith so you can make some good decisions. This is good whether you think so or not. Then you to be a provider. Now, now, being a provider doesn't mean necessarily that your wife doesn't work at all. But you ought to do everything you can to provide for her in all areas. Huh? Somebody else.
somebody else shouldn't be coming along to make Sarita feel loved. Mm. Sarita shouldn't have to deal with somebody, not that somebody can't say this, but somebody, Sarita shouldn't have to deal with somebody coming along and being the only person she's heard for a long time to say, you know how pretty you are? You want to slap me right now, don't you? <laughs> huh? Nobody should have to come along and go, <laughs> Nobody else should come along and go, That's my job. That's my place. That's what I do. My kids used to say all the time they hated it. Oh, that's disgusting. <laughs> Listen, sometimes we would go up to our room, and we would shut the door, and we'd lock the door. Not because we were necessarily doing anything, but we might need to have a discussion about something that we needed to discuss in the locker room. You know what else you, you men need to do? You need to stop fighting out in the open with your wife in front of your little kids who's being mentally tormented because of your sinfulness. We'd go up and lock our door. Well, our do Oh, man, she's not here. I hope she'll listen to this. Our daughter would come upstairs and stand outside the room. I know what you guys are doing in there. <laughs> nah, 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 nah. And I said, well, if you know then, get out of here and go downstairs. <laughs> well, that's just, that's horrible. Man, that's just, that's disgusting. <laughs> well, I want you to know something. Listen, just because there's snow on the roof, don't mean there's no fire in the furnace. <laughs> oh, man, I got to hurry up. Uh, I, I'll, I will continue to cover a lot of this in a couple of weeks when I come back on. It's hard to recover from that. <laughs> now listen, that's ordained. That's not, that's not Jerry. People say, well, you know, my Pastor Jerry, I just don't agree with your theology. That's not my theology. It's what the Bible teaches. Yeah. Huh? It's what the Bible teaches. You say, oh, I don't know about that. Okay, Ephesians 5, 22 through 24 says, wives, submit yourselves Unto your own husbands. Now, I do know before this, before this, there was also a passage that says, hey, you guys, submit yourselves one to another. How many of you know, first and foremost, even before we get to this, we ought to have an attitude of submitting one to another. It doesn't have to be my way. I don't have to be right. Most people could solve a lot of their problems if they just would quit being concerned about who's right or wrong. Man, I do wish I had all day. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as, listen, as unto the Lord. Hmm. So if I'm not submitting myself to my own husband, Pastor Jerry, then I'm not submitting myself unto the Lord. Uh, that's kind of sounds like what he's saying, right? Now, that's not, you're not submitting as a slave. You're not submitting as a walking stone. You're not submitting as a piece of dirt. You're not submitting as somebody who's um, got some dictator over you. Come on. Sarita and I have practiced this almost our whole marriage from the word go, didn't we? Here, put your books all aside and come to me, baby. You guys can talk to your wives like that too. Huh? Now, 
we submit to one another, and I've got evidence. You can talk to my kids, but I've got even more evidence than my kids. Sean Kirk right here lived with us for seven, almost seven years. Nate Kirk over there, raise your hand. Now, Sean takes off and gets married to Michaela, and so Nate decides he's going to move in. So now he's here for almost three. I don't know what we're going to do because Caden says he's moving in with us next. I don't know why because he's got it way better over there than he would at my house because I'd probably kill him. Now, I didn't have Sean move here, though, and just walk up the street and say, hey, Sean's moving here. Just thought to tell you, you need to get that bedroom ready. Her and I talked about it, discussed it, shared, prayed, sought the Lord. Both of us came together, and we both said, I believe that's Jesus. And we did it. I didn't come to her and say, hey, Sharita, Nate's coming now. After she's going, finally, <laughs> empty nest. Nate's coming now. He's going to be living with us now. So I just want you to get everything ready because now Nate's going to come. And we'll just transition Sean, praise God, over to his own house with Michaela. And Nate will come in. I didn't do that. We prayed about it. We were pastoring our first church, Hamilton, Ohio. We had been there a year. I'd been in great conflict, great conflict. I mean, a lot of, lot of, lot of problems, issues, devils, demons, spirits, all kinds of things, hierarchy in, in the church's government as far as in the organization, problems, issues. And, and Brother Payne, who uh, was here a minute ago, he had to leave, but Brother Payne called me on the phone and wanted me to come to Kentucky. And I thought, Hallelujah, glory to God, deliverance has come. I'm out of here. And I said, Sarita, we're going to Kentucky. And she said, Jerry, I don't feel that's what we're supposed to do. Now, I'm being transparent with you, but I'm telling you the truth. Jerry, I don't believe it's what we're supposed to do. But Jerry felt like, but see, Jerry was being governed by his flesh. She was really hearing from the Spirit, I believe. Now, God uses it all. But I told her, we're going to go. Now, look, did I make a mistake? I sure did. I sure did, let me tell you, because hell didn't stop just because <laughs> we left Hamilton, Ohio. It visited us again there, which God taught us great lessons. But I'm going to tell you what Sarita did. She said, well, the decision is, the finality of it is yours. I submit. And we went to Glen Lily, Kentucky. And I'm just telling you, we weren't there a month. All hell broke loose. I had to stop some heresy that was being taught. I had to stand up for some stuff that was wrong, and when I did, it was a prominent person in that congregation, in that community, and 30-some-odd people walked out of our church in less than two weeks, of a church that was only running 70. Do you know what Sarita never did to me? She never came to me and said, I told you. I told you we weren't supposed to come here. We weren't supposed to leave. I told you. Why didn't you listen to me? Because I want you to know, oh, and all hell broke loose. It didn't just break loose on me. Man, she, she almost got blew up while we were there. We would have never had that happen if I wouldn't have went there. But she almost got blown up because they had an old makeshift stove, and we were taught how to start a fire because that's the only heat we had. And we were using corn cobs that were dipped in, in, in um, kerosene. And, and we got some bad kerosene, and she went in one morning to, to light the fire. And when she lit that thing, it was mixed up with gas, and it blew her clean across the room. She didn't say to me why her eyebrows were gone. <laughs> Singed hair on the side, arms, everything. She didn't say anything to me when she had this red face aglow. I mean, she was aglow, and it wasn't the Holy Spirit. And she didn't say anything when, when I said, I'll, I'll go get you a rag. She didn't say anything when I ran in there. Oh, God. And I'm getting a wash rag, and I bring it back, and she puts it on her face, and she goes, Ah! Oh, Jerry, it's not hot water. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
she didn't say to me, she didn't say to me, we sh- we, I told you we weren't supposed to come here. Oh, no, she submitted herself under my authority. But I'm going to tell you what, if I would have had to stand before God on that day, guess what? It, he wouldn't have been pointing his finger at her. He'd have been pointing his finger at me saying, hey, you're the one. Same thing he did with Adam in the garden when Adam said, God, it's that woman you gave me. Adam, God says, no, Eve, she was deceived. And you know why Eve was deceived? Because the, her jellyfish, spineless husband was off over here, paying, not paying it. He was standing there probably, not doing his man thing by being the authority and stopping it before it ever got started. God said, your wife was deceived, but you sinned. Say what, men? You better be getting your act together. Because when you stand before God and you've not allowed him to be your head and then you've not been the husband you're supposed to do, he's not going to be saying to you, oh, oh yeah, I understand. I, hey, Sean, I understand why you were doing what you were doing. It was that woman I gave you. You should have, you should have disciplined her more. He's not going to say that. He's going to say you weren't the man I called you to be. Why? Because he's underneath covering the umbrella, the umbrella of Christ. He says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. And then what does he do? He he goes on, and and, you know, because here's what we want to do as women, and I'll I'll talk about this more. Well, you know, if he would just do right, I'd have no trouble submitting him in. If he if he just would, you know, if he just would talk right, act right, do right. If he just would be a man of God, if he just would follow the word, if he just would bear some fruit, I would. I'll tell you right now, I would do it. Which, which, you know, just get your rebellious self on back. Because he goes on that same pa- passage. He goes on in, in, in the Peter passage when he's talking about that. Why so much? He says, even unto those who do not honor the word. So what does he say? Does he say your husband will be won by when you get in his face? That got louder, didn't it? Turn me off for a minute. When you get in his face, but I don't have to do what you want to do. I'm not going to do what you want to do. You can't tell me what to do. Is that what's going to win your husband? No, the Bible says a woman doesn't win her husband by the adorning of her hair, the plating of her hair, the putting on of apparel. Gold and silver, jewels. He says, he says, the woman doesn't win her husband by outward adorning, by the plating of the hair or the wearing of gold or the putting on of apparel. Woo, look how sexy I look in this. I know this is going to cause my husband to jump through hoops. And then we walk in, and he just goes right by us like he didn't even notice us. And we're like, oh. well, some of the reason he didn't notice you is because he just remembers about 35, 45 minutes ago. <laughs> He's still seeing that devil-looking face you put on a while ago. It's, it's, it's made up. It's got makeup on it. It's got some things on it. And I tell you what, it's not the old barn look. It's got the earrings on. It's got the nice dress on. But he's still seeing that. <laughs> you don't never do what I tell you to do. We've had a list this long for years, and you don't never do it. You know what I would do to Sarita if she told me that? I'd say, well, I guess it's never going to get done as long as you're doing it like that. I tell you what, I'm hearing this in my own ear, and it it sounds okay. (laughs) 
No, you know what he says? He says, wives, here's how you're going to win your unbelieving husband if he is an unbeliever. You're going to win him by the gentle, quiet spirit that God's put in you. You ever watch the movie War Room? That movie will tell you how a woman is supposed to act. Now, I hope you know by sitting here that I'm not justifying man's behavior. Huh? But let's get it right. You know what? I'm going to stop there. Stand with me today. The goal of the church should be that we would walk in kingdom power, kingdom authority, kingdom rule. In every area and aspect of our life. How many of you know if you got one area out of whack, it will affect the other areas? Hello? You know, if you're cruising along to the right in one area, it's going to affect the area that you're trying to do over here. No matter what you think. Well... You know, I would, I'd be a better husband if, if God, you just wouldn't have gave me a badger for a wife. <laughs> or a goat. Every time I go to do something, God, she's just standing there going, but, 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 but. I'd be the man of God you want me to be God if you just give me a wife that's what that scripture says right there. Honoring me as they honor the Lord. Us men, we like to walk around going, hey, I told Sri this a couple times. It didn't go over well. But I told her, hey, hey, Sarita, you remember how Abraham, how Sarah called Abraham Lord? <laughs> you need to get your act together. I haven't heard you call me Lord once. <laughs> and I want you to know, all the way up to this time, guess what? She still don't call me Lord. <laughs> and she's one of the most submissive people I know. But I can't get the Lord part out of her. Oh, you know what, Pastor Jerry? I, I, I would do... I would do what he says if he just would come to church and honor the Lord and the Word of God and, and be the man of God and if he wouldn't, all, he wouldn't just fly off his handle and blah, 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 blah. If you wouldn't have gave me the Tasmanian devil, God, I would have served. I'd do right. Hmm. Well, God doesn't say that. God teaches us to rise above our circumstances and to rise above our challenges and to rise above people. Pastor Fred reminded us men today, and if, I, if I'm thinking about another time, Pastor Fred, you can get on me later, but I think it was this time here. He, he reminded us men today in the devotion for the men how that we have, we know the enemy. He's working on us through our circumstances and people. Well, you know what? God gave me the power to step above people. God's given me the power to rise above my circumstances. When I walk in the Spirit, he says, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not obey the lust of the flesh. You won't be doing what that thing on your shoulder is telling you to do. You'll cast down vain imaginations. You'll walk under the authority of God. Men, we need to walk under the authority of Christ. We need to love like Jesus loved. He says to us, husbands, love your wives. We like that. Uh, you are to love me. You are to do for me like the, like the, you do for the Lord. When he says to you, you need to love your wife as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And you out here, you men come to me and you're trying to tell me how much you're praying, <laughs> how much you're crying out to Jesus. Pastor Jerry, I pray, I pray all the time. And then you treat your wife 
like she's a second-rate citizen or like she's a piece of dirt. I want you to, if you're not loving her like Christ loved the church, he's not even listening to your prayers. Read the scripture. God's called us to walk under our authority, to walk it out, to live it, to walk in humility, to, to, to submit one to another, to live a life that God has called us to live. It's not something that we have to work hard to understand. It's something that we just need to read and see and do. Because he's got our whole life before us. If you want to know what your life is supposed to be like, open the book. Read the book. Come on. Read the book. want our elders and deacons to come up front try to even it out on both sides please quickly I want us to join hands and if you're uncomfortable with holding somebody's hand you don't have to hold anybody's hand okay with it. Join hands, please. And I want the elders and the deacons to declare over us that we are going to be a people that honor the word. That we are going to be a people that honor our covering and authority that's over us. That we are going to be a people that submit ourselves to authority. I want them to declare over us that we are a people that can live and walk in harmony together, working it all out. Listen, listen, get this through your head because this really is how we up here operate. It's not my way. It's not their way. It's not my church. It's not my ministry. It is ours. Do you know that everything that goes on in Bethesda here, it's ours. Not mine. People say, and I, I cringe a little bit when they say it, I know what they're saying. People say, well, Pastor Jerry had this vision for Impact School of Ministry. Yes, I did. Pastor Jerry had a vision for Impact Christian Academy. Yes, I did. And I shared that vision. People have got on board with the vision. And people have made it better than I could have ever made it if I was trying to do it on my own. That's not my ministry. It's our ministry. We have a men's ministry here. I love these men. I love these men in leadership. Pastor Fred leads a team of people. He, I said he leads a team because Pastor Fred has this title, but he's not in charge. Did you hear me? He's not in charge to do what he wants to do and go in any direction that he wants to go to, no matter how good it seems to him. He has a team. And if he got his team together and he wanted to do something, but the team said, I don't think that's how we ought to go about doing that right now. He needs to submit to the rest of the team. And when he walks out of the meeting, pull on his Hawaii shirt. When he walks out of the meeting, he doesn't get over here with Brother James and say, oh, James, yeah, you know, I talked about this other day. I wanted to do it, but the men's team didn't want to, and they went a different route. Oh, no, when he walks out of there, guess what? Whatever they decided on that team in that meeting, that's what they do. And everybody on that team speaks the same thing. They don't go behind the scenes and go, well, I tell you right now, I don't care what they're doing. I don't like what they're going to do, and I don't believe in what they're going to do, and I don't care what they're going to do, and I don't think it's right. If you're that way and you're doing that, you don't need to be no team leader. You don't need to be on no team. You need to submit yourself and pray and repent and get yourself right. We 
want harmony here. I'll tell you what, it's not one breakout, it's not one thing, it's all of us together. So when we go out to find solutions, what do we do? We find solutions. Thank you, Natalie. In the mouth of babes. Yeah, tell me, tell me, you, you go ahead and say what you want to. You tell me my, our children's church don't have their act together. Huh? That's why some of you adult, you, you teenagers, are getting your act together because you started out getting your act together in children's church. together. They're going to declare over us all these things I'm talking to you about. And they're going to declare over you that God, Holy Spirit, you're going to plant that in us. You're going to help us to walk this out. You're going to help us to live this. You're going to help us to be this together. We're going to be accountable to one another. We're going to pray for accountability. I don't know about you. Oh, man. It's just not an insult for somebody to see you out doing something you shouldn't do and then walk up to you and go, hey, brother, what's going on, man? Why are you doing that? This is not right. That's wrong. But you need to cry out to God. Come on, I'll cry out with you. But you need to cry out to God and get yourself straight. <laughs> who, the heck, who do they think they are? I'll tell you who they are. They're, they're children of God. They're doing what the Scripture says. If you see your brother in a fault don't sit back and go you know what his fault you see nobody else should ever hear it out of your stupid mouth but him instead of you yakking and ratting on people won't you go to them in love and say I love you so much I don't want to see you do I declare over this congregation, they're going to declare it over you, that we're going to have accountability. And I, I finally, I want them to declare that we're going to love God and we're going to love one another. In the name of Jesus, amen, you pray as well for that to happen in your life. Brothers, pray.